Welcome back to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm so pleased to be joined by cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto, a four-time Oscar nominee who was nominated this year for his incredible work on Martin Scorsese's epic film, Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, Rodrigo, congratulations on the nomination. Uh, it's very exciting, I'm sure. Yes, it is. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it. Uh, this is your fourth film with Marty. Third Oscar nomination, one for uh, Silence and the Irishman. And now this, I assume the Wolf of Wall Street nomination was they miscounted the votes or something because they don't even understand how that happened. But uh, I guess looking at this film, you know, what kind of challenges did Killers of the Flower Moon, I guess, create or present that differentiated it from like the previous collaborations you've had with Marty? Well, first of all, uh, it, it, it is kind of crazy to imagine that I could even one day in my career say, yeah, it's my third nomination with Martin Scorsese for an Oscar. Like, what are you talking about? And uh, so it's 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 thrilling. And and um, I feel very privileged to be in this position. <laughs> so thank you. Um, well, every movie I've done with Scorsese is actually pretty different to the previous one, mm -hmm. uh, even though there is obviously something running through them uh, at the same director and in this case the same cinematographer so um there are conversations we've had for other projects that bleed through perhaps and and uh our working relationship has evolved and and uh from the beginning i think even in wolf of wall street he he was able to make me feel very comfortable and i tried to do the same with him i tried to really listen to what he's saying and what what he's trying to do and bring ideas that are always based on what he is looking for you know and and um he's a very visual cinem that's cinematographer director very visual director obviously um but he doesn't talk in uh technical terms mm -hmm. obviously he understands the technical aspects and he knows focal lengths and he knows everything there is to know about cinema and filmmaking uh but he uses the language of emotion and um and and certainly he designs the shots he does this sh these shot lists and sometimes with little diagrams sometimes with little drawings and uh it's very specific about how he wants the shot to feel so then it's up to me to come up with a, a lens that'll deliver that or or a texture or a lighting you know and and uh, the focal length you know if we're wide angle if we're longer lens and to deliver that energy that he's looking for so uh that's something that i've come to enjoy with him and killings of the flower moon in particular is a project that kept evolving the 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 ideas of the look of the movie just as the script kept evolving as well you you might know that the script originally was uh, the perspective was more like the book, which is the start of the FBI and the story of Tom White going to Oklahoma and learning about the these murders and trying to figure out the case, a who done it. Uh, the the movie we ended up doing, as you know, is is more the story of the of these killers, and we know from the beginning that they are the killers, and that William Hale is trying to do this and influence his nephew. So uh, I think the challenge was as the stories point of view was evolving also the way to photograph this was uh, changing and, and, and so it was very interesting that I kept presenting ideas to Scorsese and he kept also talking to me about thoughts he had and, and it, it all came back to how we represent stories because um you see in the film, you know, that they have, uh, you know, the Osage home movies and the newsreel footage and uh, and the photographs, the period photos. And later in the film, we have the radio station. These are all versions of telling the story of the Osage. So and we're doing the same thing. So we thought that how do you show storytelling in a way visually? Well, through photography as well we thought and and uh, so i proposed this idea of, of uh, using uh separating the the world view of the osage and their rituals and their life from the descendants of the european settlers the white people mm -hmm. so um i i looked into the beginning of color photography and really fell in love with autochrome which is a technique that the lumiere brothers pioneered you know, turn of the century in, in, in France. So uh, this technique to create color was imported from Europe, 
you know, so that became uh, just uh, philosophically an interesting way of representing uh, Ernest and Hale and and those folks. Uh, whereas the Osage and their own rituals, we try to photograph in the most um, naturalistic way possible in terms of color. Uh, then there's a moment where everybody is in, in this um, moment where basically everything is unraveling uh, when when the house explodes, uh, Bill and Rita, Molly's sister, and Ernest, his guilt, feelings of guilt and his confusion is growing. Uh, uh, Molly is getting sicker. And so then I start stop the differentiating between everybody. And we gave them all this look based on ENR, which is a technique of printing film that um, is very high contrast and desaturated. Uh, this was a technique invented in, in Rome uh, that um, Vittorio Sorato was involved in creating. Uh, he used it in the movies like Reds, yeah. things like that. Uh, so we emulated that feel for the rest of the film, except the final scene, uh, the radio station. And that we emulated three strip Technicolor. That's why that scene is so colorful. And uh, that's because that moment happens in the 30s where, you know, color, you, you think maybe not in terms of still photography, but in, in cinema, you know, and, and the musicals of the time and that's when three star te technicolor was in vogue so that's why the film has all these distinct feelings and looks to them it's because we're representing a story and and through color photography and black and white photography we're representing these things it's amazing you mentioned like how like yeah like how much the the script on this one evolved right and like the story evolved like, and and also how like marty like you know as planning out like he's visual like i guess so how did that impact like was there more of a, I don't know if improv improvisational is like the right word for it, but like, are you, was it like, were you able to, like able to plan as much for this then? Or was it like kind of things were changing so quickly sometimes that you had to like keep up with like what the script was, how the script was evolving? Well, I think we we did have a, a, a good prep period when, when he was still working on the script. So that's when I shot many tests and, okay. and, we looked even into pinhole photography and, and it was a little too extreme. So we discarded that. Uh, of course, as it talked about um, tinting and toning black and white negative, which is also pretty extreme. And it's a technique for creating color on black and white film in the beginnings of cinema. So we tested that, but again, a little, you know, so we, we were playing around with all these concepts and, and then, you know, ended up nailing uh, down what we what we thought was appropriate. For example, we also used Petzval lenses. Uh, actually, uh, in Panavision, they they designed these um, Petzval uh, anamorphic lenses, <laughs> which distort the edges of the frame. And and we we like the look of it because it's also a, a type of lens that was used in the beginnings of photography. But we use them exclusively for shots of the Osage when they're dead like those overhead shots they have this sort of distortion on the edges and then we brought them back for when molly is really sick also when her sisters are are dead the shots of, of her sisters uh had this distortion on the edges so again we used these uh photography techniques to in this case symbolize death or death approaching you know so uh there were all these things that we did decide in pre-production uh, I think on on the set uh, we things were changing, but the the look and the basic ideas were already decided. But it was more of a just a practical thing that uh, you know a scene now changed and it's now this different way we have to right. react and light it differently. For example, you you mentioned about like uh, capturing with like the Osage, uh, the death, and like the, those. I was one of the scene. One of the, my favorite moments in the film, or is like when after Lizzie Lizzie Q dies, and you have like. Uh, the cut to like it, it's just that whole sequence I found so beautiful and I guess how did you kind of like approach that uh, scene when uh, like she's basically walks off right into the uh, afterlife I just I, it's just an incredible moment in the movie it like kind of like just stops me cold when I see it I guess like yeah how was how did you guys talk about like how to capture that and like visualize it okay well I'll tell you a little bit of a funny story about that is that uh, the intention for that scene was do this exact same shots that uh, are when she's dying and her, her people are around her and then have the shot now, nobody is there except the ancestors that are arriving, right? And the colors, you know, that one of the main ancestors that gets close to her is, has paint red on his yeah. body and his head. And, you know, so when, uh, when I was testing three strip Technicolor, 
for the end scene, which wasn't originally on the script, you know, the radio station, that wasn't on the script originally. It came up as we were filming the movie. So now we talked about that look and, okay, how about we do that scene with three strip technicolor? Of course, he loved the idea because, you know, he 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 knows three strip technicolor very well, which, by the way, was a big challenge because if I had to design that look and figure it out digitally, you know, with film cameras, but... <clears throat> digitally find that look I had to be sure it was accurate so I went into the deep a deep dive into it to figure it out but the scene I used to test it was that one we had already shot it and I was like mm, I need a scene that has color in it so we tested it and we loved the way it looked so we kind of broke our own rule and, and that scene was originally intended that it was very going to be very naturalistic the color but we love the enhanced color of technicolor the kind of the innocence of those colors where green, for example, the green grass doesn't have different shades of green. It's kind of like one green, you know, and, and the sky looks like one shade of blue cyan, you know, so um, we loved it. And so we kept that technical three strip technicolor look for that scene, you know, so it, it's things like that. But um, I don't know, Scorsese is always open to what he feels about something in the moment and and that happens certainly with his actors and this is something that happened there it's not an intellectual decision it's just a gut feeling yeah you, you mentioned the actors obviously lily gladstone nominated for an oscar best actress so i love her performance because it's so i just never I, it's just an incredible performance like so internalized so uh, it's quiet capturing so much subtlety in it i guess like as a cinematographer like how how do you how do you work with like I mean how do you kind of capture that and like work with like work with that performance where you really are I mean like I said like it's so in, like she's got to say so much without saying anything right and like I feel like if you uh, maybe a different filmmaker and, and different cinematographer doesn't get this kind of performance from her or captures what she's doing you know what I mean because it's so nuanced yeah 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 you know I for me, it was a discovery also as we were shooting. I didn't know what she was going to do. And, and the character Molly didn't necessarily read the, uh, just on the page the way she did it. But as soon as we started filming her, I re we all realized that, that me as a cinematographer really uh, started to appreciate the gravity she was bringing to this character and 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 the the sort of the quiet uh, confidence. And, and I don't know, it was uh, just such a beautiful thing. So powerfully feminine and and uh we all started you know feeling that we had to photograph her in a different way and if you notice uh as as the movie progresses she's more centered on the frame uh, little by little and 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 we start going into her point of view for example when she goes to the train station and you see all the people around her looking staring at her all the white people you know and these are the murderers that are, you know they are not specifically those people but potentially they could be guilty of the murders of, of her people you know and um so we the the camera and the cameras the language of the camera becomes subjective not only to Ernest but also to Molly and I think a lot of that was came from her performance we we kind of changed the way we were shooting just because of what we felt uh, around her uh, and even there's a moment later in the film after the explosion of, of her sister's house where the camera comes into the house it's a point of view of Ernest and Scorsese asked her where where were you going to be where would you be at this moment and she said I'd be in the basement and we hadn't planned that at all that wasn't the idea that we didn't even know if there was a basement on this house but because of that we started looking we found the basement of the house and we had changed everything on that same day and the shot now goes into the basement and there's that interaction between the two of them that came out of her and of course of Scorsese's flexibility and willing to willingness and desire to to involve the actors in the filmmaking process and and it's one of my favorite moments in the movie yeah it's an amazing scene and like just heartbreaking for her too another great moment for her for for uh, lily and, and molly as the character yes. just incredible i want yeah. to add, not to just keep asking about like specific scenes but i really love the work in this film the, i wanted to ask a little about like the last scene we get between uh Ernest and and hale in the jailhouse I just think I've watched that scene like many times, even just divorced from the movie, because I just think it's the De Niro and, and Leo in that scene are incredible. It's like so good. Uh, you get like obviously these two incredible actors, like all their history together. And then the character I just love the moment so much. And I guess like and I love the way it's shot. I just think it's like so 
I feel like, again, that scene could have been a million different ways, probably. And I guess, like, how did you guys kind of decide how that would look? And then also, like, capturing those two performances, like, at, like, the height of their performances, basically. Yes, yes. That scene, again, was uh, not totally fleshed out on the script. Uh, I understand that they kept working on it uh, with DiCaprio and De Niro and Scorsese, and they kept sort of workshopping it and, and trying it. And, and uh, it was, I think, the day before we actually shot it that they finally settled, okay, this is what we're going to say. Uh, we All we knew was that they were going to face each other, you know, and Leo was outside of the cell and, and Hale was uh, inside the, the, the cell. And um, even deciding what cell they'd be on was a whole process. You know, we, we had the set that Jack Fisk built on the basement of the, uh, a church and... Um, and, you know, it was a whole process, you know, and just historically, where would it be, all these things. So finally, we decided, okay, this is going to be Hale's cell at this moment, and, and Ernest is going to come down this hallway between the two cells. And so at that point in the film, I had already segued into a lighting pattern that's much harsher than in the beginning of the movie. So the deep shadows and... Um, uh, you know, for that set, we had these light fixtures that were on top of the cells, and I was actually and and literally using that for lighting, and and so I was aiming those light fixtures at them, at the position they picked. So we tilted them with magnets <laughs> so that they would light their faces. But uh, so it was really harsh and hard light. But then you can really the eyes, you can really read. So I had to hide little LED lights between them because we shot it with two cameras. Sure. simultaneously which we did for most dialogue scenes and and uh with so two tricks two difficult challenges were the eyes and hiding lights between the two of them to get into the eyes but also if they move to one side now suddenly one eye is blocked by a bar you know what i mean yes yeah. so you can't tell the actors you can't tell hey mr robert de niro don't move that that's that's where i see both eyes don't no no a little more that okay don't move can't do that right so we had to have both cameras on sliders and uh, sort of just adjusting subtly depending on where they were and so it was challenging and the tension for me not them but on the set I was really worried you know if if if, if they were bringing this performance in this amazing moment to the camera I have to be sure to capture it you know uh, with the cameras and I think we did but it, it, indeed I'm, I'm happy that you like that scene because it I was terrified of it. I must it's incredible. Yeah, it's an incredible scene. It's an incredible uh, film. I guess, like, just the, like before we wrap up, like, I mean, like you said, like fourth film with Marty. Hopefully, maybe, hopefully, another another one, right? Keep 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 the train moving. I guess. Uh, but I guess, like, you know, like how, like, looking, like, what are you going to take away from this experience specifically on like Flower Moon, like that you would think of for like it, what would what is like something that stands out to you about this work on this specific film that you'll take to your next project or something? Well. Uh... I don't know if to the next project, but for sure, the experience of working with a community like the Osage was very, very special to me. And, and um, it's just something I'll carry in my heart, uh, the, their generosity and, um, you know, just just how a, a group of people are keeping their culture alive. And, and that's, to me, the end of the film. I hope I don't spoil it for those who haven't seen it, but it's not a starting point, but we see from above this ritual that's alive and and the people they're not dressed uh, you know in the period in the 20s or 30s they're they're dressed contemporary you know it's an actual ritual that they do and we witnessed which was a, a big honor because normally it's just for osage so we were allowed to to witness a, a dance scene of this sort um uh the, the drums and the community dancing around it so scorsese saw that and said we have to shoot this we have to photograph so they actually composed this song yeah. for us because it's it this song they actually sing would not be appropriate for something that's not their specific ritual, you know. So they made this song, and it it it's just so beautiful that that uh, we were allowed to do these things and and to be allowed into their communities and and I don't know it was just a a beautiful thing and and, and an important thing also to tell this story that that's has been until now pretty much unknown yeah. so it's an honor to be able to be part of telling this story yeah it's an incredible film and you did an incredible job obviously uh rodrigo prieto an oscar nominee this year for best cinematography for kills of the flower moon uh thank you so much for doing this appreciate it thank you chris 